Hello and welcome to ATARC's webinar series. Today, topic experts will discuss strategies that agencies can implement to provide a better experience with the cloud and how they can achieve the full benefits with one in place. My name is Kirsten Patton, Working Group Program Manager here at ATARC, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's panel discussion. I would like to welcome our attendees and a special thanks to Jasmine Kapoor and the Denodo team. This afternoon, we are going to hear from our panelists, followed by a Q&A where we will pop in a few polls and then answer your questions. Before we begin, I want to encourage the audience to submit questions of their own in the Q&A section of this platform. We'll be going through them throughout this panel discussion, so please send them in as we go. And also remember to answer the poll questions as we put them up in order to ensure that you receive your CPE credits for attending today's session. Now, with that being said, I would like to turn it over to our panelists. Please introduce yourselves, share your name, title, agency, and anything else you would like our audience to know about you or your agency up top as it relates to the discussion. First, let's start with Susan, please. Hi, thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Susan Greger. I'm the Associate Director of Data Science at the National Institutes of Health, where I lead um, a small team that works across NIH. So in wide activity to coordinate and uh, start and pilot and instantiate data science technologies and capabilities across all of our 27 institutes and centers. And I'm happy to be here. Awesome. I would like to hear from Stephanie next. Hi, uh, my name is Stephanie Miller and I work as the FAA's Federal Aviation Administration's Cloud Strategist. Um, currently tasked with standing up a cloud center of excellence for the agency. Um, at the FAA, I'll talk a little bit more later about our journey from cloud first to cloud smart and the lessons learned that we had along the way there. And at the FAA, we have a multi-cloud environment. We have AWS GCC, AWS Public, and we also have Microsoft Azure platforms. Thank you. Awesome. And let's hear from Paul next. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Paul Theron. I represent Denodo. I'm a senior solutions architect. Um, had many years of experience uh, across uh, BI integration and now working for Denodo, very focused on integration from a, a virtualized perspective. Um, really excited to be here. Really excited to kind of drill into some of the challenges that I think will be unique to the, these kind of agencies. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And as a reminder, again, per, uh, audience participants, please send in your questions if you have them. And you can specify which panelists you want to be answered, or we can just generally go around and have each of our panelists answer those questions for you. With that being said, the topic of today's discussion is on strategies for leveraging data in a multi-cloud environment, but let's go around and each panelist, if you could please share a little bit about your journey to the cloud, uh, what your cloud migration story might look like, or you know anything that you um, want to share as far as experiences and how and why you got started, I think that would be a great place to kick things off. So I'll turn it over. We'll just go in the same order. We'll go with Susan first. Thanks. Um, it's been about a three year journey to uh, instantiate a program that we call STRIDES, Science and Technology Research Infrastructure for Discovery, Experimentation and Sustainability. And it's our partnership with Google and AWS, and potentially additional cloud service providers to provide state-of-the-art data storage and computational capabilities. We also uh, provide through these partnerships, training and educational re resources for researchers. That includes PIs, uh, postdocs, graduate students, and in some cases, undergrads, as well as for NIH staff. The, Partnership also provides innovative technologies such as artificial intelligence and machine learning that can be leveraged by our intramural researchers and our extramural researchers. So with this partnership, we've moved more than uh, 110, I think it's about 115 petabytes of data to the cloud that includes Google and AWS. And particularly, we've moved 43 petabytes of public and controlled access sequence uh, data into both Google and AWS, and that's everything from sequences, genomic sequences of rats and fish and mice and even people and the people data or the people genomic sequences are controlled access. 
So I just want to point to one use case, and this comes from our intramural researcher, Dr. Hari Shroff. He's the chief of NIBIB, that's the National Institute of Biomedical Engineering and um, Imaging. He's also the section head for high resolution optical imaging. Uh, and what he does is he develops novel technologies for studying biological processes uh, at unpre unprecedented speeds and resolution. He has been able to improve the performance of his 3D optical imaging microscopes and also the, um, the depth and analysis that he's able to do of those images by partnering with, um, in this case, with Google Cloud platforms to move this data to the cloud and then by working with them to um, basically work on improving uh, the speeds by applying artificial intelligence to those algorithms, he's able to really speed up the process of um, being able to um, take uh, research understandings from those images. And so that's, I think for us and for our researchers, this has been a really big benefit uh, to be able to partner with our cloud service providers and to leverage their capabilities for data science in the cloud. Oh, very cool. Thank you for sharing that with us. And then over to you, Stephanie. I'd love to hear about your cloud migration journey. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, the FAA started its cloud journey about a little over five years ago when the direction from NIST was pretty much cloud first. Um, and so we took that literally and we jumped feet first uh, and learned as we went along. Uh, back then, you know, and even now, DCOI was a big initiative for or a big push for why people were migrating to cloud. That's the data center optimization initiative. So you thought the goal was just to shut the data centers down um, by any means necessary. So our cloud contract was being mostly let out of our infrastructure uh, directorate. And so when we let, when we made our first cloud contract, we also did it through the broker model with an integrator. So we had an integrator between us and our uh, cloud service provider. And at that time it was just AWS. And so many things that, you know, we didn't anticipate, first of all, the services that were in our contract were just infrastructure as a service services. So IS, right? And so we award this contract, we have access to things like EC2, EBS, all of the infrastructure services, but we had no pass offerings whatsoever. So, you know, obviously you can't move applications from the data center to the cloud. You need a database. We didn't have even relational data services in the cloud. We didn't have S3. We didn't have all these things that we needed to move the application. So it was like we awarded this contract. We got our authority to operate. And as soon as we got that authority to operate, our CIO is okay, Get let's get all the applications into the cloud. And then you're like, we can't do that. So, you know, it took improving our relationship with our integrator in order for us to get a better contract, one, where we had access to those PaaS and some SaaS services like RDS and S3. Uh, we couldn't use our DevOps tool chain. We wanted to use DevOps to go to the cloud, but we didn't have API access. We didn't even have console access. We were very limited through a third party tool like Agility or Cloud Forms in order to be able to even move our assets into the cloud. So all of that was a lessons learned. The other thing we we took cloud first, literally, we, we absolutely said we would make no more investments in the data center. So no one could put any infrastructure in the data center. If you needed new infrastructure for some reason, you needed to consider a cloud migration first. Um, obviously we found that, you know, supporting current operations, particularly in something uh, in a mission as critical as our national airspace and, and making sure people can travel safely from one point to the other, you know, keeping our current operations uh, at the same service level began to be important. So we had to come up with a waiver process. And obviously we had to, we've had to and continue to make some additional investments in our on-prem data centers while we look to migrate to the cloud. Speaking of migration, um, 
that was also a challenge that we had, you know, just finding viable candidates. When we first put cloud in, we, we really didn't have uh, the domain knowledge in house for our FAA employees. We very much relied heavily on our integrator, which is why we chose that broker model, because we knew our workforce hadn't been developed in cloud related technologies. And we thought the broker model would help us if we had an integrator who was well versed on those things. But there were so many challenges in terms of, you know, being able to put FISMA high, a lot of our applications were FISMA high, getting those into the cloud, we had far too much technical debt, things that were tightly coupled monolithic applications that were difficult to move licensing. We had a license structure with Oracle with our um, ELA with Oracle that we couldn't even put our Oracle licensing in the cloud. So you couldn't move the application there if you couldn't move the database license and, you know, having to try and pay for that in the AWS marketplace was cost prohibitive. So um, we had, a you know, we had a lot of challenges and what we did was, as we made this shift from cloud first to cloud smart, one of the things that we started to do uh, in the last six, seven months is stand up a cloud center of excellence to get that cross alignment throughout the agency to tackle some of these challenges and to really take the right approach to our cloud adoption. So, you know, we started we started looking at things like uh, AWS savings plans, moving from on-demand instances to reserved. We set up our CCOE and it looked at, we had about five value streams under it, governance, improving our governance. Um, we looked at technical agility, being able to, ha to have our technology be able to change and adapt as the business changed and adapted, right? Uh, obviously, we have to be very agile in our business and we need the technical agility to support that. Um, agile, that led to us having another value stream of agile contracts. You cannot be agile in technology if you do not have the procurement processes to support it. So agile contracts was another one. And then customer centricity, right? Making sure that we are looking at things from the value proposition of the customer, looking at doing continually measuring customer satisfaction. Another thing we did under customer centricity was to stand up a community of practice for those early adopters of cloud so they could share lessons learned and best practices in their, in their cloud adoption journey with other FAA business partners who were adopting as well. And then the last value stream under our, uh, Cloud Center of Excellence is continuous learning. And we have done a lot to develop our workforce so that if we were to change integrators, if we were to change contractors, we at least had some skilled in-house technical uh, professionals that were career FAA employees that understood cloud. So we have that's ongoing now, just this week we're having a uh, security engineering certification course. We've been uh, offering certifications on, on solutions architecture, on security, on systems operations, um, just to really make every opportunity to develop our workforce. We've been putting, putting up labs uh, for people to be able to just explore after they take their training so that they don't lose it. They have a lab environment at the FAA where they can actually start to move assets into. So uh, that's that's our journey here at the FAA as we transition from cloud first, jumping in feet first, not really knowing everything, to the shift up at NIST to cloud smart and really taking an approach where under cloud smart, we try to automate everything, um, have very good governance, be very cost effective and uh, with our strategies for adopting clouds and what services we use, et cetera. So. Excellent. Well, congratulations you and Susan on you guys' you know, journeys and it sounds like it's been quite a journey. So that's incredible. Um, Paul, so from the industry perspective, I 
it'll be a little different since you were with industry and not with government, yeah. but you just work with government. And I'm wondering, you know, does any of this that Stephanie and Susan shared um, resonate? And what are some of your thoughts about what you see from your customers and um, any insights that you might have uh, from the Denoto perspective? Well, yeah, that, um, I think there's a lot of crossover. I think the, the government agencies have a little bit more um, challenges from the point of view of the, the, the kind of bureaucracy that comes with government agencies, right? Um, I will just say to Susan and both Stephanie that I'm very comforted to know that you guys really do your work. I mean, you know, next time I get on a plane or next time I have to go to, you know, any, any kind of healthcare scenario, I know that this is well thought out scenario. So, you know, I'm, I'm very happy about that. Um, a couple of things that I, I uh, obviously, you know, we help clients migrate to the cloud. We help people abstract information in the cloud. A little bit about virtualization technology uh, to try and simplify it. We're that kind of semantic veneer that sits on top of your data assets and provide that one point of access, regardless of where the data sits, regardless of how that data is stored. Why is that cool from a, a cloud perspective? I think Stephanie hit the nail on the head when she talked about moving from cloud first to cloud smart, because you know every use case has different kind of um, factors that you have to take into account. For instance, we, we see a lot of our clients who have gone cloud first, but they've left it to departments, right? So some departments have adopted Google Cloud Platform, Azure, Amazon, as you can imagine, they still have the same challenges after each department, you know, um, adopts a cloud strategy, they still need to provide this one view of data, right? So that's one of the benefits from a virtualization perspective, giving each department the flexibility to make the right choices to suit themselves, but you know, when you talk about that veneer where everybody can access data regardless of where it lives, um, the, the, the virtualization layer kind of hides that complexity from the, the, the client. And why I think that's useful, um, well, obviously, because it makes life simpler for the client. You know, us guys who've worked in IT for years know that the one thing that's on your mind is let's not try and drop below that 99.9% .9 availability SLA, for, for example. Migration always causes problems. Uh, we had a, class, uh, a client who took a, an approach to migration where they migrated from NetEaser on-prem to Snowflake. And the first part of their migration was to implement the semantic layer and get all of their users to integrate via the semantic layer. Now, as they started to move information to Snowflake, it was very easy for them to um, join that information into that semantic view. And from the client's perspective, the user's perspective, they didn't see any difference, right? Because they're just going via semantic layer. Now that helped them through migration, but what they found was post migration, they found that, well, there's no need to get to ri get rid of the semantic layer. And that was proven out because they still had um, this hybrid um, architecture. So when I talk about hybrid, you know, the, the dream is let's get everything into the cloud, everything will be cheap, we can shut down our data centers, but obviously that's not true. Um, so we need to be able to give those users the ability to get to data, regardless of where we technical people decide the best data to, play, data to live is. So even after migration, you still need that semantic layer. And plus, we're kind of in the middle of this uh, I would say this technical digital revolution, whatever, whatever you want, technology is going to change. We know that the, the landscape now will be very different in five years. How do we kind of al allow the IT people to do the best job and to, to do make the best technical decisions without affecting a very, very smart and very demanding business consumer nowadays? So, you know, in a nutshell, um, from a Denodo perspective, what we've seen is the, the cloud migration is, is happening. It's full on. People are taking the benefits, but they still have on-premise. They still have the choice of cloud. And from an organizational perspective, uh, you know, the consumers don't care as much as we do. They like the idea that technology is going up there, but really we're just shifting data centers, really. And they don't really need to be worried about that. Anyway, I'm going to take the sales hat off now and uh, open up for the conversation. Great insights, thank you. Um, Mel, behind the scenes, could you please pop up 
thirst poll question so that we can get everyone their CPE credits that are here today. And the question is, do you have a current project program that requires data from multiple sources in real time? So you can answer yes, no, you're unsure, or you're currently looking for a program. So be sure to answer that. Um, let's go around and talk about you know, the importance of migrating to the cloud for those on this call who uh, don't know why it is so crucial and you know, tie in the data aspect to that as well. Like how important is it to be keeping up managing your data? Um, anything that you have thoughts around, you know, significance, importance, benefits. Um, Susan, we'll start with you again. Thanks. Yes. So um, as you can guess through our Strides partnership with Google and AWS, we've uh, moved quite a bit of data to the cloud, but we've also moved a lot of data platforms to the cloud. And so now I want to give you a use case of what we could do by leveraging cloud computing to better enhance our understanding of just, for example, um, the genetic causes and underlying variants um, to pediatric congenital heart disease. This is a rare disease. I, I think all pediatric diseases are considered rare. And it's super important um, for parents and for children to uh, diagnose and to treat, to the best of our ability, congenital heart disease. Um, it's close to my home because my husband um, is, was a, uh, has congenital heart disease. And so this is an important area of research. Many participants who contribute data, either genomic data or other data, contributed across NIH. Um, and this is certainly true for pediatric studies. And so the situation that we have is that there's genetic data in multiple repositories or multiple platforms on the cloud these are all disconnected. And so what we wanna do is we wanna be able to provide data interoperability and aggregation across these platforms. And so this is a key effort that NIH in my office in particular has begun to pilot. It's an NIH cloud platform interoperability program, really to establish and implement guidelines, technical standards, and empower end users, researchers to find, to access, and to analyze data across NIH cloud platforms. These could include the platforms that are sponsored by NHLBI, one such as called Biodata Catalyst for heart, lung, and blood and top med data, the NCI's Cancer Research Data Commons, which is uh, all the cancer data, including pediatric uh, cancer data, the NHGRI's Analysis, Visualization, and Informa Information Lab space called ANVIL, which is focused on GTEx or genomics data, as well as phenotypic data, the Common Fund Kids First Data Resource, so the pediatric uh, data from genomics as well as other data uh, does reside in Kids First. And then uh, incorporating and interoperating with an NCBI database of genomics and phenotype uh, data. That gives us a fairly large um, and well-maintained and curated compendium of data for which we would like to, again, find, at, at, find and analyze across these platforms. So one of the first key objectives we had in, in creating interoperability plat platforms was to implement a common authentication and authorization mechanism. And this is really the first step for interoperability. It's a single sign-on um, authorization authentication for controlled access data and all genomic data is controlled access, allowing researchers to authenticate uh, uniformly across these platforms and then creating an ease of access to the data that they've already gone through the process to have access to. So that's just the first step in creating interoperable platforms. We've also leveraged fast healthcare interoperable resources. FHIR is a common technology for querying data and exchanging data across these platforms through common standard APIs. This is super critical um, to have a FHIR server. We're piloting this um, in partnership with the HL7 Balkan Accelerator Program to integrate data types such as phenotypic data into the FHIR format. And we're piloting the use of the FHIR resource for basic searching across data platforms. So this is something that we will be exploring more. All of this work that I'm talking about really does require a community um, of testing and, and adopting technologies, APIs, but also standards. And so we've partnered with GA4GH um, to uh, implement, for example, streamlining data access through their data repository service, data use ontologies, and, and authorization authentication protocols and visas. This is uh, work is um, just a first step and we're rapidly utilizing these capabilities to address COVID and long COVID through our recover program. We'll be piloting new capability, 
practice, such as privacy preserving record leakage to deduplicate COVID participants across data platforms and then to aggregate participant data, such as imaging data with electronic healthcare data. So all of this is possible because we're leveraging the cloud. If we didn't have these platforms in this, in this data in the cloud, I think that the capability would be much, much harder to instantiate. It may, may not be impossible, but leveraging the cloud enables us to do this really important work to solve important problems such as um, pediatric congenital heart disease. And so thanks um, so much. I, I'm really looking forward to the work that we'll do moving forward. Yeah, that's awesome. Wow, thank you for sharing that with us. Stephanie, I'm gonna turn it over to you now too, as well as the importance of migrating to the cloud, things that you've seen added benefits. What are some of your thoughts? Oh, Stephanie, you're muted. Sorry. Can you, I, I want to get the one struggle out of the way first, right? Mm -hmm. um, and before I get to our benefits, our struggle, particularly in government, everything comes down to budget. And so you have this early um, belief, and, it, and it, it's not necessarily untrue that cloud is gonna be cheaper and that, and that cloud is going to save agencies money, right? And then people come to you and they've got this one application that sits on one server, the database, the middle tier, the front end, all of it. And you tell them how much it's gonna cost for them to have this thing in the cloud annually. And, and they're like, you've gotta be kidding me. But um, the, the challenge for the FAA, I don't know anyone else who has that challenge, is they really aren't paying on-prem, right? Most of our, the, the, our IT organization manages our data centers. And so the cost there, they don't go back to the organization. And so they will, they will um, see that they're paying, you know, a nominal fee for a server or for their infrastructure. They don't see beyond that. They don't know what it costs to environmentally host it. They don't know what it costs for backups in the systems that, you know, if something were to happen, recover their data. They don't even know what it costs to make sure that they have continuity of operations and all of those things. They're not used to paying it. Now you switch to cloud and in cloud, we have um, a multi-account model so that every project gets its own account with its infrastructure, and of course, the cost for operations and maintenance is in the cost of that infrastructure. And so they're comparing apples to oranges. So I'll just say that in terms of we have not yet been able, what I have done recently is try to get someone to look at total cost of ownership. So we have an algorithm that shows, look, this might be what you paid on-prem, but this is the total cost of ownership to the taxpayer for your application being on-prem. And then once you show that versus what the total cost of ownership to the taxpayer is in FCS, then you start to see, but they're still like, I've got this budget right here. This is what I've got. It's not, so I just wanna go over that challenge first. Obviously, obviously the benefits to cloud are um, first the, the scalability, right? Um, just being able to scale on demand, um, the interoperability of things, and 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 also, um, <clears throat> just we have increased automation and better deployment. We have much through containerization and through DevOps. We our cloud environments are much more portable, right? Um, in terms of data, that for us, data analytics has been one of our biggest benefits of going to cloud, obviously with the FAA, we deal with, with tremendous amounts of data. I mean, if you think about an airplane moving in the sky, they go in and out of different controlled airspaces where one tower is gonna have so much data on, on that plane's flight path. Another um, center is gonna have more data on that plane's flight path and as they go, People, different people are collecting millions and millions of tiny bits of data. Every little point or fix along the path that that flight travels represents one piece of data. So there's an enormous amount of data that 
having that data, having those data sets in the cloud, right? Um, which is something that our, our uh, enterprise information management platform uh, is working on. Having those data sets in the cloud makes it much easier, God forbid, that we have to start doing recovery and understanding what happened you know, or, or recreating the path of an aircraft that may have had an incident along the way. And now quickly, and you think about the types of data, not only is it large volumes of data that make up the big data analytics, but there's different types of data. Now you've got the, the airspace data from the control tower, you've got voice data, audio from the pilot that may have been com communicating with not only one control tower, but different control towers. And like someone said, uh, currently we have a system that is our national offload program where we have an actual server sitting at every center, center um, across the country that's by an airport, right? And we're keeping that data is controlled there. So getting that data together is difficult when you need it versus having all of those data sets in the cloud where you can ingest it, clean it, enrich it, and provide analytics on it instantaneously um, is a huge benefit for being in the cloud. So that's what I would say. Oh, that's awesome. Really cool stuff. Thank you. And then Paul, I'm gonna turn it over to you with the same question, um, importance of migrating to the cloud, how would you articulate that to folks who are in their beginning phases? Oh, Paul, we cannot hear you. And maybe it's the headset. Right, it's that special button on my control. There we go. <laughs> so my apologies, guys. Um, yeah, so look, um, I'll, I'll echo both what Susan and, and Stephanie said. I mean, I mean, the key thing is, and what, you know, from an industry perspective, it's not just that there is a lot more data. Everything is digital nowadays. You know, your watch is digital. It produces data. It needs to be stored somewhere. You know, before that, you know, um, you wouldn't get information from your car, right? Or, you know, especially in the healthcare field, there's just so many devices that create information that needs to be stored, needs to be analyzed. Plus the different types of consumers, right? We, you know, we, 20 years ago, I'd argue if, if anybody would know what a data scientist is, but that's actually a, a, a real job nowadays. And, and it's because we've got so much information, there's so much insight we can get from that information. The problem is where do you keep it, right? And, you know, you know, if I just have to keep buying real estate to, to store information, that just becomes cost prohibitive, right? So, you know, what the Bezos of the world have done is, is given us a great viable option to kind of store all of this massive amounts of data. They've created cool products that suit the needs for business. And also, you know, the other thing from a business perspective, you know, I, I don't have to worry about that anymore. You know, oh, uh, sorry, Stephanie, if you're saying something, you're on mute. Oh, unless she's talking to somebody else. Um, sorry, I didn't, didn't know if Stephanie was commenting about my comments. Um, but the, the key is, right, more data, but also more consumers of the data who need more of those disparate bits of data. So obviously, you know, putting everything in, in, in the same place, either it be in a lake or a data warehouse, but in the cloud, makes it easier to get that information to different people. What we found though, again, is demands on that data is so diverse, right? Um, from your data scientist to your standard, you know, bit, uh, you know, uh, exec that maybe wants to click the button on his dashboard every morning to see how they're doing. The demand on that data is, is much more diverse. And it, it's just, I think it would be impossible, very impossible for a, you know, a guy who's just looking after his data center to be able to, to meet all those needs. It helps when you push all that stuff into cloud. I don't, I can have my, my resources not focus on operational issues, like is that server running, but more focus on how can I serve my user community who are asking all of these really wild questions. Um, another good thing, you know, kind of Susan mentioned research, right? And, you know, I wanted to mention um, the, we did, we did some work for National Health Service in Scotland. Um, and one of their challenges was, I mean, obviously they had invested quite heavily in cloud. Um, when they looked at things like cancer research, you know, they have all this information coming from their main centers and they put that information into the cloud. 
But what they struggled with was, well, when that patient goes back out into the field and they're going to their regional centers, their rural centers, and information's being stored there, they, they lose that picture, right? So even though, as I said, majority of their resources were in cloud, right? And that works for them. You still need to be aware that there's that other vital information that is out there somewhere that will maybe it'll eventually get into the cloud or not, but it's the, the consumers need it now. So I guess to answer your question, the cloud is very, very necessary for anyone who's got that IT, you know, the IT scars of honor, who understand, you know, the, the back end. But from a consumer's perspective, I would argue that they per personally don't care whether it's in the cloud or not, or from their perspective, everything's in the cloud. Right, so it's 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 really dependent on who you're talking to, but obviously moving to the cloud gives the benefits to everybody. And I'll stop there. <laughs> Insights, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Mel, let's go ahead and pop up the second poll question, which I believe is, is your data in the cloud? Yep, or on-prem, hybrid, or multi-cloud? So you can answer whether it's in the cloud, on-prem, hybrid, or multi-cloud. And there actually was a question about that. I think this might be of interest to some of our attendees. Um, how does my multi-cloud differ from hybrid cloud? I, I think those two terms can be sort of confused. What's the major difference? Um, Paul, do you want to answer that one? I knew you'd ask me first. <laughs> you, know, I, you know what, to be quite honest, I, I think it depends on who you're answering, asking, to be okay. honest, because you know the way we look at hybrid, from a Denodo perspective is there's some data on premise and there's some data in cloud. We don't particularly care how many clouds or how many different cloud um, uh, deployments you have. From our perspective, if it's in the cloud and you've got data that's on-prem or somewhere else, we consider that a hybrid deployment. Okay, and then Susan or Stephanie, do you guys feel similarly to that answer? Yes, that's exactly how we would define it as well. There's a uh, hybrid could include on-prem at data centers or HPC facilities um, and, and cloud. And, and we, we support all three. Um, it's a large organization and there's no one size fits all type of research question. Right. Great. Well, thank you guys for coming. I'm gonna second that, but I would just add that um, it, it, all of it, whether you're in a hybrid or a multi-cloud, how you architect your data is gonna depend on what, which environment you're in. Um, and when I say that, it's really in terms of cost because ingress, you can put data into the cloud as much as you want. The moment you need to pull that data back down, there's an egress cost for it. So it costs you anything to put data in the cloud, it costs you to take it out. So when you think about architecting your applications, you have to think about, will all this data that goes in the cloud eventually have to come back on-prem if you're in this hybrid model and what that cost might be? Even in multi-clouds, um, you know, in some cases you can't move data between clouds if you're trying to go between public and GCC. In other cases, if you're just trying to move between services, we found out recently just from doing log aggregation, right? We were using Splunk to aggregate all of our OS logs, et cetera. And you have like a three year retention requirement for that. So we thought we'd move it from Amazon's S3 to Glacier. And we found out that there's a cost per object. Well, logs are these tiny that we, we generate millions of logs a day. And so now you're moving from, from S3 to Glacier and you think, oh, it's not a lot of data, but it's a lot of objects and they charge. So you be very cognizant of what architecture you choose and the costs that are associated with it. So I that. Thank you guys. So let's go around and discuss strategies and or anything you wish you had known prior to the cloud migration. What is some insight that you would want our panelists to walk, or sorry, our attendees to walk away from, from attending this session? And we'll go back to our original order. Uh, Susan, starting with you. Um, I think that I'm gonna sort of echo a little bit about what Stephanie is saying is that um, I wish that we had, thought a little bit more comprehensively about the data strategy and moving to the cloud, because exactly as, as Stephanie is saying, what we're finding with you know, 43 petabytes, for example, of sequencing data, we have to move 
a certain amount of this into cold storage, glacier, um, for example. But when a researcher wants to access that data, it has to be thawed. We pay that cost as well. <laughs> um, so moving data in and out of different storage um, options is also costly. It does you know, potentially save us money in the footprint of the, of the storage, um, but it requires a lot of management and, and tools to be developed to do so. And finding that data in the, in the glacier is also an issue. So, so I think, I think it would have been helpful if we had really thought about this, this mat, the strategy and the implementation of, of, law, of this amount of data in the cloud and how we were gonna manage it and how we were gonna compute across clouds and manage that. We're working, we're building the airplane and flying it at the same time is essentially um, what we're doing. And I think that's probably not unique. I think that many are also doing the same thing with their cloud strategies. Um, thank you. And then over to you, Stephanie. Um, I would think that I would wish that we did not take the if you build it, they will come approach to cloud, right? <laughs> that we did this sort of in a silo, our infrastructure division said, okay, they told us to stand up cloud. Cloud is about taking things in the, it's just a data center, you know, in that, that we can't touch. So they thought all we need is data center people to do that. Um, if we had had that knowledge, if we had taken the time to really take a, a more of a, like a scaled agile approach, we'd recognize that we needed buy-in from the business up front. We needed buy-in from our leadership up front. We needed buy-in from our application people up front. And, and this really should have been more of an enterprise effort rather than something that was focused in one area because it does impact everyone. So. Um, that's sort of the approach. We just were not, we didn't, even in the beginning, we thought, someone thought that government community cloud meant that everything that the government needed needed to be in GCC and that public cloud was for everybody else. And so then we find out later on government community cloud, it's really just about who gets to be your neighbors versus, you know, uh, you have to be there because it's government and it costs more. Right, and so now we've made that shift. We we did all this time getting our ATO in GCC in Government Community Cloud. Then we realized we really should have been in public, and now we made that shift to get public cloud up. So really, just that we didn't do it in a silo, and we really looked at it as the enterprise investment that it should have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And then Paul, um, strategies, anything that you think, you know, agencies should be considering first? Um, I think you obviously have a strategy. I think Susan and, and, and Stephanie hit on, on the head, you know, regardless of what your strategy is, get some executive buy-in because they need to be aware that something's happening, right? Um, as I said, you know, you know, being a vendor, we always sell you on the benefits of moving to the cloud. You know, for, I see business benefits from my perspective, um, but I, 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 I would also ask yourselves, you know, what, ask that question to yourself: Why do you need to move into the cloud? And prove the answer to yourself first, because you're going to have to prove it to everybody else, uh, you know, regardless of different levels. You know, if you go to somebody, say, for instance, in production, and they're going to say, hey, look, you know, some of this SaaS data is going to be in the cloud. The first thing they want to know is, well, what, what does that benefit me? And also, how does that make my life more difficult? Right. And you have to answer all those questions. So IT people technical people see the benefits of moving to the cloud without even really thinking twice about it. But, you know, as you quite rightly said, you know, you start to, you know, spin the benefits to the rest of the community. And you might find that some people in the community say, well, I don't particularly care, you know, and then you have to think about that. And, and sometimes it's viable and it's, it's real and you have to make decisions. Um, and the other thing is also, you don't have to go for the big bang. You can, you can trial. You can, you know, take bits of information, put it into the cloud, have a look at the costing, have a look at the, the feedback that you get from the, con the, the consumers, your end users, right? And then use that to kind of, you know, tweak your ongoing strategy, you know, um, 
it's you know you don't have to mow the whole the whole field just do a little corner and see if the the lawn mower works for you right that's the kind of point i'm trying to make there um but yes strategy is really important but you know i think the most important thing that i've just mentioned is getting senior sign off so they understand it and then when you have to justify it down below you say well hey these guys get it and they get why right um that's the best i can do as a vendor to be quite honest <laughs> no that's great ask yourself first why you need to it's like when you're 16 and you convince your parents you need a car to go to school every day <laughs> so many added benefits that's right you just can't tell your parents of the added benefits because <laughs> always in the fair it's right anyway excellent well thank you guys so let's pop up our third poll question and it should be are you considering implementing a data management or data asset discovery tool such as a data catalog? And your answers could be yes, no, my agency is currently working on this. We are in the works or never heard of it. So we can talk about that poll question real quickly, actually. Are you considering implementing a data management or data asset discovery tool such as a data catalog? Um, Susan or Stephanie, have you guys done so with this data catalog? Um, we have done so. Um, we, as one of our earlier efforts was through the Big Data to Knowledge program where we stood up a, a data catalog uh, called Biodata Caddy. I, I think it's still, uh, it's still out there for researchers to look at. Um, we're also standing up something um, that's sort of the next step beyond that work at NLM. Um, and we're investigating, you know, further opportunities for researchers um, in the community to assist in standing up a data catalog of sorts, because this is really an important component of finding data is um, being able to to have some way to search for it, you know, in a method that actually makes best use of potentially ontology schema metadata, for example. Um, and so this would this would assist in that capability. So the answer is yes, and, and we will continue to invest in that area. Awesome. And Stephanie, how about you guys? Yeah, we've been doing it for a long time. I mean, we, we've had tools like Denoto and, and Tableau and others for a really long time. Um, we, we had a data.faa.gov for a really long time. Um, we have our SWIM data asset that has been around for a really long time. Um, and, and then in the last few years, uh, we, the FAA established a chief data office with the chief data officer over it. And that's what our EIM program grew out of, our enterprise information management program. And that consumed all of the other data programs under one organization. And they're all under EIM now. So where we used to have, where we used to have these different you know, data stores all over, all over the place. They're now all coming under one umbrella. So yeah, we've been doing this for a while. So we see we have one audience question come in. Any of the panelists, feel free to jump in and answer this. But Javier Thomas asks, do you have suggestions or strategies on how to get teams connected enough to actually get these requirements for data architecture? Well, I would say that, um, if, the, if you have a chief data officer in your organization, starting those efforts there and letting them lead it is one. Um, if not, you need some sort of, uh, we used to have, oh gosh, again, like a, a, community of, a, data, a community of practice around data um, that, was led out of our solutions architecture group, but uh, again, I think that if you if you have you need like uh, someone mentioned earlier, you need executive buy-in on things like that. And when you want to get into in a, really managing data at the enterprise level, and we've had a huge challenge with that at the FAA, right? Because um, just an example, we have air traffic organization and, and they look at a runway as, as for one thing, if they can't land on it, right, or if they can't take off from it, it's not a runway, whereas our airports organization looks at it as something completely different. And so when you start to look at 
data architecture from your enterprise level, um, just making sure that it's being managed at the appropriate level is important enough, right? So that you get the same story, no matter where you go in the organization. If you go, if you ask our airports organization, how many airports we have, they're gonna give you a different number than our air traffic organization because they view airports differently. So it's making sure that you're managing the, your data and normalizing your data at the right level in your organization. Um, and then if, if you're doing that, then that's gonna drive uh, your architecture of, of your organization. And most people start with the technology and not so much the normalization of the data. And you really have to start with what your enterprise information is, what your high level taxonomies and what your business, you know, just defining those high level taxonomies and knowing what your business, your important information is at the enterprise level first is, is, is where I would start. Yeah. I, you know, sorry, carry on, Susan, but no. I'm going to echo what you both are going to say. Carry on. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, work that I started at the Department of Energy uh, and then carried over to NIH. So when we're thinking about requirements gathering for architecture, for um, implementation of strategies, we always uh, started with a basic needs requirement document, which um, is, uh, it builds first from the use case. So what is the use case that I want to actually accomplish? And from that use case, what is the then the architecture and the implementation plan and how can I do this in an agile way? And so that that building that basic needs requirement document is, is a variety of stakeholder engagements um, to understand what is needed and why, and what does the end goal look like? And then from that building out your technology platform. And I found that to be a fairly uh, successful strategy when developing platforms in, in architectures and, in, and infrastructure because it, it sort of sets the expectation of what does the end user need from this platform? And from that, I can, we can start to do the right types of stakeholder engagements to get the implementation strategy. And so I would, you know, I would say that, that, at least from my experiences, and I'm working with researchers, that that, um, that is a good strategy. It, it sort of helps alleviate to some extent the build it and hope that they will come a phenomena, which I have experienced in other bioinformatics um, uh, uh, activities, um, both in biomedicine and in environmental uh, cl and uh, climate research. I, I was going to say that, um, you know, again, you know, clearly it's good to have some kind of strategy around data for your organization. And part of that strategy should be about, you know, um, selling the concept of data literacy and you know the you know the the media is 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 throwing out this kind of these um, cliches and memes about a data driven organization right you know and 90% of that is related to the way date people use the data the 10% is where we store it, how we give it to them right so you know when we talk about data driven organizations it really does involve people and so you've really got to get the the, the your average person in, in, involved, right? The insight isn't always going to come from these kind of really smart people living in a room crunching numbers. It's going to be by that person who's working on the line and realizes that the numbers that they're looking at have an effect and, and communicating that up or down the chain will make a difference, right? So, you know, try to, to push um, kind of programs that talk about data literacy to, to Stephanie's point, you know, what is a terminal over here and what is a terminal, you know, compared to a, an airline, for instance, you know, that all of those kind of uh, that kind of terminology needs to be um, kind of managed and and agreed upon by humans way before computers kind of get involved. Right. It's pretty much the same thing in healthcare, um, Susan, when you talk about things like your anoint codes, your ICD-9 and your 10 codes, being able to have that kind of conversation about all of these different types of terminology in healthcare. What is a practitioner? What is a provider, for instance? Um, and also another way to get more people involved is to try and, I think, talk about how a good cloud architecture 
gives you more than you've had before, right? So we're talking about how we can get over this situation, this, this issue of siloed information, right? Now, as I said to you before, it, you know, it, it really depends on the way your organization decides the way they want to let different departments store their data. But certainly if there's an overarching strategy, they can be mindful of things like sharing data with other departments and you know what that means when they start to implement their strategy. So, you know, I'm not giving you a, a silver bullet answer, um, but you know, literacy, education, and talking about data without talking about technology actually will help people adopt it because then once you've had that conversation, they're going to say, okay, where do I get this information? Oh, we have a data catalog. On the, on, on, on the point of a data catalog, data catalogs are great, but remember also that, you know, you could end up having multiple data catalogs as well. So think about that when you're putting your strategy together as well, right? How they can all be um, aligned and, 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 and synced up. Stephanie, you're on mute. <laughs> I was saying that's why stewardship and ownership is important yes. as well, because um, even, you know, nowadays, most of your systems are being built um, in like a microservices architecture so that, and in a microservices architecture, you, you focus on a service doing one thing and doing it really well, and that service owns its data. Right, so it, someone else can make a request for that, but they can't manipulate that data. They so, and and to do that is based on to do that is based on the notion that you know where this data's point of origin is and who can manipulate it. Right, and and without having that proper data stewardship and ownership and understanding, you know where the concept of an airport even originates. It's okay for someone to have a different need or a different interpretation of that data, but it's also important that you understand where, who, who's getting that data, what that data represents, and does it meet their needs for how they want to use it. And that's a very hard thing. It has been a, a huge challenge at the FAA um, and, it, and it really starts with, with making sure that you have good data stewardship and ownership um, to, to understand, to me, if you're, if you're coming up with an architecture and you're move, doing a service-oriented architecture, particularly a microservices architecture, what, what entity owns what data? And that, that's the best thing I can, I can say. It's a really hard thing to me. It's not one that um, I've seen us do well yet at the FAA. So real quick, we're pushing up against time, but it seems like there's some confusion around what data normalization means. Someone said, were you, I don't know if they meant Paul or someone else referring to data standardization and DM as data normalization, or maybe we could clear that up real quick. That's, um, so I, you know what, it's, it's a big subject, but if you kind of go back to the days of uh, data warehousing, why we went for data warehousing, right? So all that information was stored in these systems of record that was stored in the way that system of record needed to store it. When we want to do analytics, when we want to look at that information, we have to kind of normalize it. We have to standardize it. We have to kind of change data types so they actually are meaningful, for instance, um, you know, it may be stored as, uh, I don't know, um, uh, one kind of integer form, but you may want to store it as decimal in your, da in your um, data warehouse. Um, from the point of view of, you know, re redundancy as well, we want to aggregate information. That's part of normalization. There's a number of different uh, normalization forms, and it's actually like a, a, a part of your thesis when you go to school, right? So I can send you some information, but it's a very big subject. But the idea is, Get that information that is kind of optimized for transactional, you know, systems kind of a system of record kind of this application is creating this data. Now I want to make this data consumable for normal people who want to ask analytical type questions and need that data from all these different sources kind of normalized um, and, and put in one place for better analytics. I'll put a link up as well um, in, in, in the post. 
Fantastic. Thank you. So we are just about out of time, 30 seconds or less. I want to hear from each of our panelists. Uh, what do you want to leave the audience with? Final thoughts, lasting impressions. Let's start with Susan, please. Um, I would say that our, you know, our experiences in migrating to the cloud and using cloud have been um, very eye-opening. It's enabled a much, much greater data science capabilities, a lot of interesting work in artificial intelligence. Um, and it's also pointed us to some, some challenges that we now have to address. And so I would say that um, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity, but one should definitely uh, consider all the different facets when, when thinking about um, cloud computing. Uh, oh, nice uh, point from Paul there in the uh, understanding normalization. So um, <laughs> yeah, I, I look forward to continuing this discussion because I think that there's a lot of, of ways in which we could have just conversations even about data normalization, which mm -hmm. in and of itself is a huge, huge effort. Absolutely. Thank you, Susan. Really appreciate that. <laughs> and then over to you, Stephanie. Just say be agile in your approach. I, I mean, just start small um, and learn and improve, continuously learn and improve um, as you go along. It, that, that's the, because things are gonna change constantly, requirements are gonna change constantly. And if you are agile in your approach, you'll be able, you won't get so far down the road that you can't adapt to that change. So that would be. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, I would just add to that, that, you know, um, don't be afraid of making mistakes, right? Because it's going to happen. That's the way you learn. Also, remember, you are in the middle of like a digital transformation, right? So if you go back to the Industrial Revolution, somebody just invented like, you know, a wheat flasher, and now all the side inventions are coming off. It's the same thing with digital. You, in five years time, we may have to rethink this whole conversation, not even talk about storage, but talk about memory, right? Because that's what everyone cares about, right? So don't be afraid go for it and just as stephanie quite rightly said be agile be ready to to change right and uh, and to susan's point keep the conversation going right because this is this is how we we change this is how it's going to happen excellent well i think that was a fantastic way to wrap it up and um i appreciate you our panelists and our attendees for being here today thank you again to our partners at denoto and we hope to see everyone again on july 22nd from 1 30 to 2 30 p.m this will be for hrx webinar on leveraging on-prem cloud to protect critical applications and physical security. So if you enjoyed this webinar, which I hope you did, I certainly did, then you'll enjoy the next one. So we hope to see you there and everyone have a great rest of your day. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.